Today's guest in the Boodoo Room is a very talented singer-songwriter who hails from Sunny Kitten. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you, Taylor Sheridan. You grew up in Kitten, mate. How was early life living on the farm? I look back on it way more fondly than being in it. I think when you when you live in a small country town, it's pretty easy to think, you know, the grass is greener on the other side and, you know, what's it like being in the big city? And But for me, those years are by far the most influential on my life now and I learnt so much um, just about just community and just being able to communicate with people. I, f- I feel like that's probably been the biggest trait that I've had to deal with in the music business. And in those formative years, you know, you know everyone. You know everyone's family, you know everyone's name, you know their story, they know yours. So I think for me, just being able to really engage with people and f- and get to know them on a real deep basis has kind of led me in good stead for, um, yeah, for my adult years. What was the population like back in the day when you were growing up? It wouldn't be as big as what it is now. No, now it's now I think it's about ten, fifteen thousand. I think back then maybe like three or four thousand. Yeah. It wasn't a trendy place at all, you know, and, and especially from Kyneton to Melbourne when it was the old Calder Freeway, it was a long it was a big trek to get to Melbourne if you wanted to get to Melbourne and you know, you have to go through Wood End and Gisborne and Macedon and but um, yeah, as I said, you know, it was a really small town and um, the population was small, but we were really tight knit. Everyone got behind everyone, you know. And when I essentially wanted to get into music, my first gig was like at the town hall and we packed it out. It was like 400 people there and it was incredible. And it wasn't because of anything I'd done, it was probably more to do with my parents and how they were viewed in the community and then people from you know that had been my primary school teachers and my high school teachers they all came that was just that was just especially then that was just the place the Kyneton was. I've noticed when I've driven down uh, one of the main streets there you've got a really big sporting event uh, ground it's got it's the Kyneton Tigers is that right? That's it very nice. I know mate don't worry I look out for the grandstands for some reason I don't know I'm just I just got this thing about grandstands and your grandstands pretty bloody good. It is pretty bloody good and it's pretty bloody old too so it's got a bit of history there I actually played for the Kyneton Tigers. Did you? Um I actually, well, I, th- I mean, I thought I was a good footballer when I was younger. My dad was a great footballer. I have a twin brother who was a really, really good footballer. And that was kind of our way of um, also being a community member, playing sport, especially footy. If you played footy, you were pretty much okay in anyone's eyes. And if you were good, that was just a bonus. But yeah, I played for the Kyneton Tigers and um, I played up until I was 18, but um, I think I took I took sport pretty seriously until music crept into my life in a serious way. When I first started playing guitar, I think that's when my priorities changed from, you know, Tuesday night at the footy ground, freezing my butt off, kicking the footy, or I could be at home trying to figure out what this crazy thing called a bar chord is. Mm. I found that I couldn't really balance the two, being with the Kyneton Tigers or or playing music because I was just always supposed to be doing music and that was how I was supposed to be spending my time. Okay, so when did you pick up the guitar? Was that in later in your teenage years? Or? That was actually. Yeah. I started singing really early. Singing's like, you know, I think some people are guitar players that can sing or singers that can play guitar. I, I think I'm a singer that can play guitar. Um, singing was like my introduction to to, okay, I found something that I think I'm going to dedicate my life to at that point. I mean, I you know, I started at like nine or ten. But guitar was a lot later because, and I remember my best friend at the time, he was a really good guitar player and he was, and his brother, I used to stay at his brother's place, oh, at their place, sorry, all the time and his brother was into like something for Kate and Nirvana and um, Smashing Pumpkins and all these like, cool sounding bands and I was like what are they what do they play what do they play so he played guitar which you know ultimately my friend James he played 
And he was great. So when we were like 13, 14, he was doing like classical gas and like some really cool stuff. And I remember saying to him for a lunchtime, I said, you know, instead of going to kick the footy, how about we go to the music room and, and play guitar? Because I couldn't because I couldn't play at that point, so he would have to play and I would sing. And he said, oh, nah, nah, I want to go and kick the footy. And I, and I thought in that moment, you know what, I've got to learn how to be self-sufficient here. And that's how I started learning. I just picked it up and, and tried to to make sounds and, and then I started getting lessons and, and um, it wasn't an instrument that I immediately fell in love with. It took me time to really fall in love with it and um, I think with music it was quite quite quick because I I could sing, I, I did have a voice. Guitar, you know, I've got small fingers, um, you know, it, it wasn't as natural to me as singing. Yeah, it's hard when you've got small fingers. I think when I started writing songs that's when I thought I've got something to bring to the table and everything's kind of gelling because I would learn covers – and I would never really learn them properly. I would learn them like three quarters and then I would play them for people and people would say to me, oh, oh, it's cool that you've done your own spin on that song. And I said, no, I just didn't learn it properly. <laughs> I just didn't learn it thoroughly enough. And I think when I would, um, yeah, when I started writing songs, I thought, okay, now we've got, now things are starting to fall in place. And now uh, when I pick up a guitar, I kind of, I even like have a little bit of like an unspoken um I don't know, not not necessarily unspoken ritual, but more like a um, an unspoken thing of like, what are you going to give me today? What song are you going to are you going to gift me today? I wrote a song last night that I'm really really proud of, and I've been stewing on it for weeks. And I looked at my guitars, and there was one that I like my first guitar. And it's not the best sounding guitar, but I was like, I reckon there's a story in you today. And I picked it up and and there it was. I mean, I'm still a student. By no means have I perfected anything in my life. So I'm more than willing to listen to, you know, I jump on the net all the time and I watch so many writers talk about how they write and and different ways of writing. And I think for me, I, I write a lot of average stuff that I go, yeah, okay, that's cool. Like I'll just sort of be jamming and I'll be like, I should write just for the sake of writing. Because you do need to keep that muscle up. Mm. But the songs that I probably play live are the ones that I kind of feel like they've written themselves. And so that's just a gift. And you go, oh, okay, I, I need to grab you. Because if I don't take you, if I don't take you now, it's going to go to someone else. Mm. And I really, I really believe that. There was a great thing I was watching the other day on a TED talk. And this lady was saying about creativity and songwriting, well, not particularly songwriting, but creativity. And, and she was saying that back in the day, like a like hundreds of years ago, they would talk about a genius sort of being in the walls, like kind of almost like it's not you that's the genius, it's the surroundings and, and you almost talk to this whatever it may be and go, oh, I'm really struggling with this line here. Can you Can you help me out? And then the inspiration would come. Years later, fast forward and people started calling people geniuses. And then they would really kind of self-destruct because not everything you do is genius. A lot of the stuff that you do is actually pretty average. And every so often you would come up with something great. So I think that there's something to be said about that with writing as well. You can... I don't think I'm a great writer. I think I'm just incredibly lucky that these songs sometimes fly by and I'm lucky enough to catch them. Because when I've heard you live, um, it seems to me a lot of your music is uh, its quite an up-tempo type of uh, melodic, rhythmic um, songs that you perform. And I was quite surprised because you, um, when you released your current single, uh, you've almost gone to a different direction you've almost you know you've got this more darker element towards your music um is that because of what's happening is that a relationship to what's happening in our environment or and you're just reflecting that or is it something that you've had deep down that you're going well i want to express this now you know this is the best time for me to do that what was the catalyst for that probably that one probably just having you're right a lot of my material is quite positive and and uh, 
pretty mid tempo, up tempo sort of sort of stuff. And I think when I was writing that particular song, I tend to limit what I can say and what I can't say because you're like, well, what about if this person thinks this or what if that person thinks that? And you tend to kind of go, well, I'll let someone else, I'll let someone else do that because I don't want to wear it. If I get these questions and I don't answer it properly and I walk away and I go, oh, Pete thinks that I'm, oh, he thinks that I'm this. That would have killed me once upon a time. Now at the stage of my career and my songwriting and my storytelling, I don't really mind yeah. what people think because it's art. That's it. It's taken me a really long time to just go, it's just a time a time and place that you did it, here it is, and you move forward. That's it. That particular song pushed me in so many ways, lyrically, melodically, the topic of the song. I mean, we all, you know, I, I kind of want people to feel uh, rejuvenated when they see my set. I want it to feel good, you know. Mm. They want to see live music and they want their travels to be you know, forgotten for a couple of hours. But with that song, it was funny because in me trying to do that, when I released this song, which was a bit darker, it's called When the Demons Come, which is pretty self-explanatory, I felt like it actually connected on a way deeper level than any of my, none of my music has in the past. Mm-hmm. So that actually ended up being a real learning curve for me. I think it was like, okay, well, I've kind of taken that wall away and I've taken that boundary away. Well, what else can I do? Yeah. What else can I sing about? What else can I create? So, yeah, for me it was it was a in, it was a different direction, but a really really um, exciting one to take. Is it just a single you released? It's just or? a single. So you just you didn't have a B no. Side there was just like a, there okay. was just a single, and um, I've got I'm working on new like more material now. Yeah. Um, but as you said before, that one was. Pretty left of centre for what I'd done. So I wanted it to be just a single thing. But you actually worked in a record store. I did. I worked in a record store for five or six years. My first job out of high school, um, you know, I didn't really know, being a kitten boy, I didn't know how I was going to make music my living. So I applied for two jobs. I applied for the Qantas Lounge at the airport. And because a mate of mine, he was doing it and he said, all you have to do is pour drinks. You don't have to worry about change. Maths was never my strong suit. So I thought that was, that would be a relatively easy job or the music shop. And there was one going and I went to the music shop and I got the job on my 18th birthday. And, uh, yeah, it was to this day, the best job I had, um, well, I mean, I, I worked quite a lot when I was younger, coming from a, a, a working class family. They kind of encouraged me to, you know, I had jobs at the, I did the paper run, I worked at the petrol station, I've worked at the chemist, being the bin boy, uh, and then I worked at the music shop. And uh, yeah, it was one of the best things that I could have done because I knew everyone in the community. I ended up actually managing the store and that, I don't know, there was a, I kind of enjoyed the... Um, I was underqualified, but I kind of like trying to overachieve or just trying to even just sort of get there. Like where you think you are, you should always be trying to aim a little further than that. So that was really good for me because as I said, you know, I wasn't really good at, I wasn't really that academic, wasn't good at maths, but I somehow could find my way through it because the core of it was music. That sounds pretty interesting. Uh, Just that trans transition that you went through which is a um you know what a 15 year old boy putting out bin somewhere working in a you said a chemist right yeah yeah i used to take the uh (laughs) i used to take the drugs to all the elderly around kiton on my push bike yeah were you were you taking their drugs while you were on your push bike well if you saw the names of them they're not stuff that you want to be putting in your system (laughs) (laughs) uh so when i got the job at the music shop i'm going this is a walk in the park i don't have to touch eyebrows Great. So they, they sold vinyl records as well in the music yeah, shop? Yeah. They yep. did. And we did, I mean, primarily, at the, at, especially at the start, it was CDs. And CD, it was really interesting because everyone kept on saying to me, even back then in 2008, CDs are, you know, that was when the iPod was really pumping and, you know, and um, yeah, and it was like, you know, who comes in here? And we used to do quite well. We used to make a bit of money, like good money. 
and we had lessons out the back, but it used to really baffle me when people used to say that to me. Like, you know, do you, do people come in and get CDs? Go, yeah. We just had the new Adele CD and it went nuts. We just had the new Gurumul album that went bonkers. And I used to love that. I used to love when those artists and when their albums would come in and we'd order 50 and they'd be gone in like two hours. I used to love that. I used to really, really enjoy that part of it. And I knew that it was kind of a – it was sort of becoming more and more redundant. So I enjoyed it more because I'm like, this is probably the only time in my life that I'm going to get the chance to – so every CD that I sold, I kind of felt like it was like a lost trade to a degree. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I thought this is – um, yeah, when people would pick it up, you know, and just even hearing when people pick up CDs now, it, re- it takes me back to the music shop and how much pride I had in selling music and selling it for good money as well you know albums were at that point a good album was like 20 29 bucks 29.95 i can tell you exactly you know if it was a bit of an average one you'd get it for 19.95 but um i yeah i thought that that was um it was a really really good time were they reissue vinyl records or were they these were just cd so the vinyl stuff was much more expensive yeah that was all like 50 60 dollars and um at that point i don't on the way out of my time at the music shop, that's when vinyl started sort of really kicking on. Um, you know, we weren't – with the new releases, we weren't ordering 50 copies. We were ordering 20. Yeah. And um, it was just kind of getting by rather than like really trying to give it a really good go. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that was – that, and that was kind of my experience in the music shop. But I ultimately stopped because I started – I started gigging and I wanted my, I wanted the freedom to, to go and do that and I was really comfortable. And just a really funny quick story, I was even considering buying – the music shop came out for sale and I was like 23, 24. And I remember saying to mum and dad, like, I can't believe this is over. You know, and they said, well, why don't you buy it? This can be your thing for the next 20 years. And I really, really thought about doing that. And I thought it might, it'll get me, you know, ahead. And, you know, I even went to the solicitors. I got to that point where, you know, and I'm glad I, and I, I ended up going against it, but, and I'm glad I did because of some of the incredible things I've had the opportunity to do, to do now, very outside of the box. But, um, yeah, I often think how my life would have been differently, it would have, it would have gone differently if I had have taken that opportunity. You spent 48 hours recataloging your uh, record collection how did that how did you go about doing something like that because uh, i would find that really um i tried to do it with my cds once and it took me like three days and i i got really tired of doing it so how did you cope with it i i enjoyed it because i just moved out from Canton and i moved 20 did the sea change 20 minutes <laughs> to gisborne and uh, my girlfriend current girlfriend she was from Adelaide so when she came over we kind of got to start fresh and um yeah the records to me are are pretty sacred and um the first thing that was in there before we had any furniture was my records and the um the record shelf so that was kind of yeah that was our our first two nights in there were putting it in alphabetical order our records and, and uh, uh, who who have you got collections like have you got I've got when I first started out Elvis was like the big one that I really liked cuz you know there's those artists that are like they're vinyl artists like Elvis and like Roy Orbison and Bob Dylan like there's just some records that they're just better on records so I I really got into Elvis uh, and then I pretty much got every MJ record you can and then I got I've got a pretty sturdy Stevie Wonder collection. And then, yeah, the rest is is everyone, you know, America, the Beatles, Farnham, you know, um, everyone. Yeah, so I've, I've got a really good – and I've, I've, just, I've got the classics, you know, Springsteen. Um, Born in the USA. Yeah, absolutely. Led Zeppelin. You know, I've got the um, – you know, I've got all the Beatle records. Um, but the thing is, is trying to get the vintage ones. Because they re- they reissue them now and they're brand new, but you want the the original. And the, the the amazing thing was when you're talking about before about um going to like 
a music store and it being like a library, people used to, I mean, I didn't know because I wasn't around, but all these old records that I've got, people have written their names on them. Yeah. And they're really old school writing too. So yeah. I've got Songs in the Key of Life, which is my favourite album of all time by Stevie Wonder, and it's got Lynette on the front. And I love it because like – where has this record gone? What has this record done for someone? Where, you know, that's the incredible thing about about music. It can travel. and Well, if you came from a big family and your sisters had albums and they didn't want you to touch them or take them, they would write their names on the – that was the reason why. They would, I thought it would be like to go to parties and be like – Yeah, well, that, so they don't mismatch yeah. their records or anything like that. Yeah, you're correct. Because um, I've got – an album, my first ever album was Brian Ferry, Let's Stick Together. My sister brought me that album. That's a cool record to start off with. Um, and she's, no, Can the Can, Susie Cottrell. Oh, no way. Yeah, she brought me both of those for <laughs> Can the Can. Do you know Susie Cottrell? Yes. Have you seen the cover of Can the Can? <laughs> have you seen, have you? No, nah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lie, I have not. Okay, well, you've got to see it because it's a quintessential Bogan. Right. The band in the background, it's a white cover with the band standing behind her and she's in her black uh, leathers. And there's a guy, I swear, I think it's the drummer or the guitarist, I'm not sure, he's got a VB long neck, right? It must have been taken in Australia. Or I was going to say, yeah, because yeah. yeah, she's American. Yeah, she's a, and, and, but he's got a VB long neck and he's drinking the long neck to the side of her and it's the b- most boganist. The, quint- the, the, quint- the quintessential, quintessential Bogan, Bogan front cover. And he's got the truck driver T-shirt, you know, the blue one. And oh, all that. God. I'm, I'm, I'm dead set. And it's like, where's the art in that? See, that there's a difference between Susie Quattro mm-hmm. and the church. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I know what you, you mean. You know what I mean? That where There's the rock musicians who are like truck drivers. And then there's the musicians who are like artists, you know mm. what I mean? What, what, what goes on there, do you reckon? Because it's, it's a funny one, isn't it? It is a funny one, but it's just like people. Like yeah. I, kind of, <laughs> I, kind of like, I kind of like that wackiness. I think it's quite bold to do something like that, like to do something that people are going to go like, oh, like isn't that why like punk rock was so big, you know? Like, How have you been keeping busy during lockdown? How's your recording going and your web series coming along, like generally? Because you were doing a bit of that while we were in lockdown. Yeah, well, I, as we were talking about before. Have you been going to bed at 5.30 in the afternoon or anything like that? I mean, I'm a bit of a – I've definitely been taking early nights as many as I can get because our job, we don't get them very often. So as soon as it hits dark, I'm like, yep, I'm out. I'm going to bed. I'm taking the – Taking the days just a little bit more, a bit slower. But as far as isolation was concerned, I'd got a, I'd had a song that we were talking about before, When the Demons Come, and I'd been in the studio for a, oh, it, it must have been a year of trial and error. This particular song, I just wanted to push myself in every way possible and, and use every little bit of creativity that I had into this one particular thing. And um, so when isolation came about, I'd just finished the film clip. I'd finished, I'd signed off on everything and I thought, you know, do I hold off? Do I keep it in the in the bank and, and wait for things to settle down? And Sorry. But for, for, I think, for the nature of the song, I thought, well, it's kind of talking about facing your demons and how you can, um, how you can overcome them and, um, and sometimes they're really hard to overcome. I found on social media a lot of people were talking about their mental health and talking about how or the best ways that we can still keep in contact without actually being, you know, in the same room. So when this, yeah, so I decided that I would release the song. I just thought it would be a good time and I'm so glad that I did because I got to really hone in on the release. I got to release it with as much enthusiasm and conviction as probably every project deserves. Uh, sometimes we get a bit carried away with just other stuff. Other stuff kind of takes precedence sometimes. And um, But for this, that's all I had to do. From the moment I woke up to the moment I went to bed was just the delivery of this music. And it was the most satisfying thing I've done to date because I got to do it the way it should be done. And did you 
you've obviously got your band playing with you, right? I, I did most of the instruments on that one. So okay. all the rhythm sections, basically me. I did all the, all the drums and guitars and um, and I got a I got a I got a bass player to come in, a keyboard player. And we had some a, a beautiful quartet to come in. And he's a guy that played at Bird's Basement with me last time, Attila Kuti. And um, someone that really inspires me, just incredibly like plays music for the um, for the moment, plays notes for the, the moment before, the moment after, but he's somehow in it. I just find that really inspiring to be around. So, um, yeah, that, that song was a lot of trial and error. Some songs that I do, you know, I'll cut it with a band and, and go, that's that's cool, like that's a vibe. But for that one, it really needed to be um, – I wanted a lot of hidden stuff, a lot of uh, a lot of representation of what demons can be like and, you know, and it can be a little bit sparse and stop-starty and sometimes it's two steps forward, three steps back, all that sort of stuff. So I wanted to sort of incorporate that in the music. I think that's hard because you listen to Jackson Brown's early stuff, you know, where it's just pretty much him – writing material on the piano it's the same sort of thing you know um and then trying to sort of fit a band around a composition like that you know whether it's an acoustic guitar and voice or a piano and voice or whatever it is it's a very hard thing because you got to keep some way true to the source totally you know Uh you can you can get carried away and you can take it where it can lose that essence. And I've definitely had songs, like I'm, I'm not going to lie, I've had songs that I feel like I've lost the essence because we got too carried away. Mm. And we put it all, and we put it in a place there where it didn't need to go, um, whether that be mostly production. I think because, like, as you said before about with Pro Tools, we've got everything at the tips of our fingers and, and you go, you know, and sometimes when you listen too much to the outside noise, that's when you're sometimes the product can get... Um, a little bit convoluted, and that's that's only from experience. Some of my stuff, I go, ah, oh, well, I wish I had have um, produced it the way it was written, because um, most of the time the songs kind of tell you how they want to be. It's like oh, I need to need to kick up a gear here. Let's mm. let's use this and let, let's use that. Your first instinct is usually your best one with uh, with production, but um, that's taken me a while to get to but you have to make your mistakes yeah you have to make mistakes because i've made even with the last one i've made mistakes oh yeah totally and i listen to them and you know and after a while they don't become mistakes they actually become part of the that like photo mm. that 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 thing in the frame that you can't change you go oh i wish that white spot wasn't there and then like 10 years later you look at the white spot and it's just like well it'd be so weird if that white spot wasn't there yeah, exactly. That's kind of the way that I've. No, it's true. I, I think of um, with with production on music sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think it comes with maturity that stuff. You know, the more you do, obviously, the better you get at it. Um, if you're willing to be open to it, um, and that was something that was um, told to me uh, by one of the uh, touring acts that came to Birds, who was you know quite a reputable artist and they and they that's what their sort of outlook on that was was uh just be true to it and uh and i got the vibe that they got they they've got more control of what they're doing therefore they're not allowing the producer or the engineer to dictate the sounds or the production to them so they're actually going no i'm in control of what i'm doing and this is how i want it i can see the picture of it and i think when you're in that place it can be if you're creative enough and you can tap into that creativeness, uh, you you can really tap into something incredible. The only problem with that is that sometimes if, you, if you're not sure about it and you're just doing it because of your ego and because you can do all of that, that's the tricky one to know. That's And you've, you've knocked it on the head. It, it can be sometimes really if you do it all yourself and the decisions are all yours, it can be really one-dimensional. And then, like, there, there is something to be said, like, when you go into a studio and then you go, right, it's going to sound exactly like this. And then you get to it and it sounds exactly like that and you go, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. As much as, like, as much as your own opinion, I don't think you, you can ever really – you've always got to trust the songwriter who was there in that moment that the skies opened up and the song – you've always got to trust that person. But I think – 
it's foolish to think that other people can't influence for the better. It's a collaborative thing. Well, Music look at, look at is George, a collaborative thing. Um, George Martin and the Beatles, you know. Would, would, would the Beatles be the Beatles without George Martin? No, that, well, you know. That's definitely up for discussion, but, you know, that's. Um, it's all a part of the it's, pro- it's all yeah. a part of the product at the, product, the at the yeah. end, and you know, and if you know, I'm sure if Paul sat on every instrument, which we all know that he can play every instrument, you know, and it came out as the way that he wanted it, would it sound like the Beatles? Mm. It, it would sound like Paul McCartney. Yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, I, I think that you know, music is definitely, you know, we can't dismiss that music was made to be played with people, yeah. and it's a way of bringing us together. You know, you can't really isolate yourself in something that's so. So it's got such a great spread. I mean, the, the best thing for you, I think, is when you're playing with your band. Uh, are you going to be doing more band work? Full, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, and I've always wanted to do more, but I never saw myself as a solo guy. It was more just so in those early years. You know, there's not much budget for support acts, or and if you want to fit in, you just got to do it. Mm. And you know, that's when I got myself a loop station, got myself a stump box, tried to figure out how to capitalise with being a solo guy. And I love being solo because you get to um, – there's a lot of room. There's a lot of room to – you start with one person and, and you can create – you can really create something, but you need to use the audience. You need to use the room around you. With a band, that's what I always saw myself doing and that's when I can – that's when I sort of – the brain really switches off and I get to just be in flight and not have to worry about oh, are people digging this. People like And do the does the band have a lot of influence in in the arrangements and do they oh, tend, definitely. and they tend to change each time you play? Are you trying different things out and I encourage them yeah. to change. I yeah. I encourage you know, it's like having a conversation. You don't want to yeah. have the same conversation twice mm. and you, when you do it's always different. The words are always different. You always take a breath at a different point. That's the way that music should be. It yeah. should be a little bit more. Like you've always got a blueprint. Yeah. You know, you and I are speaking right now, we've got a blueprint of what we want to talk about. Mm. But, you know, if someone else was sitting there, it would be vastly different. I kind of like that in music. I kind of like when people bring their own, their own influences because that's, you know, Music's an amazing thing, and that's and it, and we we're talking about before about styles of music. You know, when people when things can get like that's jazz, that's pop, that's country. Isn't it just great when we just get to talk music as like a collective? Like you just put instruments in one room and just see what happens. You know, so I actually encourage my band or whoever's playing with me at the time to go to let let go. Be expressive. Play something cool. I mean, I might have wrote the lyrics and the, you know, and the and the music, but I certainly didn't create an A chord. <laughs> play it however you need, however you feel you need to play it. I mean, for me, your your whole career thus far has been uh, on a on a pretty up and up, really, hasn't it? I mean, you have have you had any pitfalls along the way? <sighs> Look. Yeah, I have. I mean, there's there's definitely times when, um, you know, maybe like there's been times for me where it's a it's a it's a funny industry, and going into it, being a little bit too naive can be sort of a little bit dangerous. But also being too bitter is too dangerous. So I think there's a nice sweet spot in the middle where you, where I think that I live now. Like I've I've definitely come across my fair share of of crap and um, and met some you know some pretty crappy people, but also I've met some incredible people that I know have influenced me and will influence me till yeah you know till it's my time. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I've definitely I've definitely had some pitfalls, but as I said before, the, the well, highs you're, you're hiding well because oh uh, that's that's good to know. <laughs> well, I mean you know people people sensitivity. If you've got if you're a sensitive sort of soul. It can be your greatest asset and your greatest weakness. Mm-hmm. It's a funny one, isn't it? It is a funny one because you think you get praised in other aspects of your life for being sensitive and, and you should be. You should be sensitive to most things. But unfortunately, when that gets used against you, ah, it stings. <laughs> <laughs> but 
at the same time, you don't want to change who you are. You no, just, that's it. You, you, you are who you are. You are who you are, and you adapt to the situation. And um, yeah, but I, I, I think yeah, I think you're right about um, trying to um, move forward. Yeah, that's what we are. That's what that's what we should all strive to do. Sometimes I don't feel like I'm moving forward, but as long as you kind of have the intention, minute by minute. That's it, minute by minute. So, who is your biggest influence on your career? From a really early age, you know, doing singing competitions all around the state, you know, that was my mum. You know, she was an incredible person for me and um, really believed in what I was doing, not necessarily because uh, she thought I was going to get big time or anything like that, but it was just more so like supporting your kid on what he wants to do and and being there for him when he lost and when he won and all that sort of stuff. So I, always, I look back at her and, and she... She was really, really instrumental for my um, willingness to get into this this game. Um, you know, I've got a bunch of music teachers that I still talk to to this day and I've got a, a music teacher actually who taught me how to play Wild Thing in Year 7, just a dun 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 Okay. And we're um, – anyway, he's a doctor of music, so on a different level okay, of, sure, of sure. musicianship. And he yeah. emailed me last week and, and said, oh, I'd really like your opinion on some of this music. That means everything to me. That is cooler than any gig I can do because it's like, wow, you've – there's something that you obviously think that I could bring – my opinion means that much to your music. Um. So yeah, probably just probably my teachers more so than than anything. Like just kind of being there at that time of my life where it is very like, do you go this way? Do you go that way? Who knows? But you know, they were like, just stay on, stay on track, and and you'll see what happens. So I would say that would be my biggest, uh, yeah, inspirations. And just uh, I want to thank you for giving back to the Mac last year. That was um, very appreciative. Um from my behalf anyway. No, anytime. Any, and, you know, that sort of stuff transcends music, transcends. It's like the core of why we are human beings and, and you know, it's great that I, it's great that I can sing and, and, and it's great that we can play music and, but like, you know, at the core of it, life is the most important thing. So that was an incredible privilege for me to do and, and to meet your brother as well. Um, that was a real gift. Mm, so as much you. as it could be appreciative, but um, yeah, I got a, I got a, a hell of a lot out of that, and we'll carry that for a long time. Yeah, thanks, mate. I appreciate it. Well, that's the end of our conversation. If you haven't seen Pete Camilleri's YouTube channel, please like and subscribe and leave a comment if you have enjoyed this podcast. <laughs> You must have cast a spell.